Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other newsmakers from in and around the Bay Area. On today's show, my guest is Kumar Malavalli. He's an entrepreneur, technologist, and a philanthropist. He currently heads a boutique a company, venture capital firm called VKRM that is located in Los Altos. Welcome to the show, Kumar. Thank you. Los Altos, startups don't start there, excepting if you're box. No, it's not a, because uh, the VKRM is a, a, we are a small angel uh, venture group and we have an office there, but the companies are spread around the valley. So we don't have any company in Los Altos. You are right, Los Altos is a sleepy, uh, very quiet uh, town, and uh, uh, as such, the, you know, this is the best place to have an office, but not to start a company. And you are also the CEO of uh, a startup, which is ten-year-old Image. That's correct. And what does Image do? Image uh, does uh, develop uh, enterprise software to make sure that the that the information is protected from disaster, and. The way it is done is if you have your application that's running in your data center, the you'll get a copy of the application and the data that is being, you, being used by application in a remote location, either in a remote data center or in a cloud. Right now, you know the cloud technology is very pervasive. We also provide the provide the uh, you know support to uh, to keep the remote copy of application and the data in the cloud in case of disaster we can help the businesses to run the business out of remote locations or cloud uh, and then when the, when, the, when the disaster is rectified you can bring it back to original main data center. So how are you different from other disaster recovery companies? So other disaster re recover, recovery companies mainly concentrate on just pure data but we on the other hand we are not uh, concentrating on just data we give importance to business continuity. To have business continuity, you got to make sure not only you have the data available, but also the application uh, that are using the data are also available, so that it, we call it a workload, that the combination of application and the data that is being used and the networking capability. So all the three elements put together, it's called workload for any transaction. Within a transaction, you can have multiple applications to to complete the transaction. So we make sure as a unit, workload unit, we we make sure that that is available uh, when the disaster happens and also uh, you can run the business uh, based on that principle. This is your second startup you co-founded? This is my second startup after I uh, successfully uh, co-founded Brocade Communications and we had a uh, great exit and after the exit and I wanted to do something else, and I uh, started the second company that is Inmate that you talked about. Okay, so you yours is an unusual story. You know, I've mentioned this before because uh, you've you've had what other people may think uh, setbacks or you know uh, bumps in your career because, like many people in the 70s, you wanted to come to the U.S. but you didn't get a visa, so you went to Germany, and from Germany you went to Canada. You spent that's 21 correct. years in Canada. Yes, that's right. Working for a large company, safe job. That's correct. Working on your standards. Yes. Fiber, uh, fiber channel. That is very true. How did you find the courage uh, to leave all that and co-found Brocade and become an immigrant all over again applying for H1 and then going through you know what all other immigrants go through. Yeah, uh, Let me uh, take you back to uh, my uh, life in Canada. Canada I you know I, you are absolutely right in 1972 I left India to go to Germany to get the proficiency in electronics engineering which I did after finishing that then I could not uh, stay back in Germany because Germany is very strict uh, about uh, giving stay permit although I had the work permit I didn't have the stay permit then uh, uh, then I had a choice to go to either Canada or, or US my first preference at that time was US but at that time you know 74 that's around that that time uh, the recession was uh, very severe and Vietnam was happening and as a result of that 
uh, I was not able to get my green card. Then, uh, then I went to my second choice. I went to Canadian Embassy in Bonn. Bonn used to be capital of Germany at that time. And they open heart, uh, you know, uh, you know, with open uh, heart and hands, then they uh, they embraced you. Embraced me. They, they gave me the uh, uh, the it's called landed immigrant status. That is equivalent to green card in Canada. I got that. Then I moved to Canada in 1974, end of 74. And uh, I worked for several companies. My uh, my passion was to do something in the area of communication. Why? Uh, because that's where you know the communication is the one that brings people together. The, uh, it's not just uh, physically, but also through information. Is it because of what you had learned in Germany, how they learned how to apply? Exactly. And secondly, you went to Canada, which is actually known for its telephony. Telephony and also, you know, a lot of people may not know, the cable television, cable technology originally came in, came to Canada. That's where it was originated. I remember in 1976, Toronto had the first cable television, not even in United, nowhere in the United States. That's where it originated. The Canada was always uh, predominantly uh, very much ahead of uh, the rest of the world in the area of communication. Of course. Was that a government sponsored? Uh, no. Did the government sponsor? No, there are a lot of private, private. companies. Pri both private and public, uh, you know, the uh, efforts were there in Canada to make it happen. And also talent used to be there, you know, to talent in the area of communication. Communication of, you know, the cable communication, telecommunication, data communication, you name it. So uh, uh, as a result of that, then finally uh, I had a chance uh, when I was working for a uh, Canadian company, which was a subsidiary of a French company called Alcatel. Uh, the, the, the Canadian company name was CanStar Communication. There I had the first chance to, to develop uh, the fiber channel technology, which is actually uh, is a communication technology to connect storage subsystems and the servers together on a high-speed network, uh, and uh, the, it was very necessary. So the, the so what was different about the fiber channel uh, technology? Was it disruptive? Was very it, disruptive. Was it innovative? Both, both innovative and disruptive. You know, before the fiber channel technology came into picture, then storage subsystem could not be networked. They were always hiding behind a server. Server, well, I mean, uh, he it functioned as a master and the, and the, and the, and the master slave, system, master -slave relationship. relationship okay and uh, and and then there were not only that there were other limitations connectivity behind the server you could not connect more than 16 uh, uh, storage subsystems because of the ports I mean, the limitation because it's of directly direct connection there's not network and also speed was a problem you could not send the data uh, transfer the data between the storage and the server in a very high speed and so, and also uh, location problem. You could not distribute the uh, the storage element connected in in a fashion that is uh, that is that is uh, independent of uh, the geographic location. What was what was uh, available? What was the alternative to fiber technology? Yes, there was a protocol called SCSI, small system oh. computer uh, interface. The SCSI, the yeah, okay, flat cable. Yes, yes. The directly that was attaching uh, storage subsystem. To in the, the old computers computer, and computer. printers would find the SCSI yeah. cable. So if you want to talk to the story system, you had to go through the server. Server becomes uh, the master. And then you were the looking for peer-to-peer. Peer, -to -peer, peer exactly. Okay. You, that's the right word, you know. Peer-to-peer. -peer. So what we did was, through this technology that we developed under the American National Standards Institute, uh, we were able to uh, take the story system away from direct connectivity to the computer, put it on a separate network, very high speed network. So that gave us three uh, important criteria. One is independence of location, regardless of uh, geography. And the second thing is speed. Mm. We, because this protocol, when we started, it was one gigabits per second. The, the latest a uh, version of fiber channel can go up to 32 gigabits a second. Mm. Same protocol, but they've increased the speed. Mm. That is number two. Is it because of software? Uh... Because, you know, it's, it's still become the protocol, the hardware. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, the third thing was number of connect connectivity. Instead of sixteen, we can we can we can connect thousands of. Uh, so it, you, it expanded. Expanded. Okay. You know that was very much needed. Fortunately for us, when we were finishing the uh, protocol standards development, then the internet became very pervasive. That was becoming. So in '88, you joined the standards the committee. Standards committee started developing the standard. '93, we ratified the standard. Then it's not enough because to to have a working system, there are several components that have to be ready within the pro uh, using the same protocol. One is you got to have computers supporting this protocol. You needed uh, storage subsystem, both tape drives and the disk drive supporting this protocol. Then we got to have a networking protocol, networking, putting switches and the routers. So that's where you came into picture, the exactly. switches. switches. Okay. So fast forward, 93, you've done, cancer, the, then you got, your company gets acquired by HP, so you're languishing in HP, exactly. thinking that HP would uh, help you. Help, exactly. And then you're in India and you get a call. You get a call. That's correct. And there is a junior partner mm. in a VC company who wants to talk to you. That's correct. That's correct. You know, when I, when I was vacationing in India in 1995, um, I think around June time frame, and uh, uh, before that, I had, you know, uh, I, I had mentioned it to one Mr. Ed Framoyer. He was one of the executives within HP, and he was going to leave HP anyway. That's why I could speak to him in confidence, and about my desire to start a company based on that protocol because HP was not taking advantage of uh, uh, of what we have done, you know, at the prototype. And so he said, uh, let me talk to a few VCs. That. So he mentioned it to Seth Nyman, who was then the uh, junior partner with the venture uh, capital, it's called uh, Crosspoint, venture, Crosspoint Ventures. And he called me uh, to come and meet him uh, after I come back to Canada, um, and in, in the United States, in Silicon Valley, in actually uh, in Los Altos. Oh. Their offices were in, oh, uh, in Los that Altos. time okay. in Los Altos. Not no, they moved to uh, they moved to Woodside afterwards. Okay. But anyway, the, based on that call, when I came back, then made a trip to uh, you know, San Francisco, and then I met uh, Seth Nyman for dinner in Stanford uh, Shopping Center in an Indian restaurant called uh, Gaylord's. Which is no longer there. No longer there. And, um, and we had about uh, two hours discussion. In, in the discussion, I convinced him the potential of fiber channel uh, based switches and how we can have, we can create a storage area network uh, that's going to predominantly be used in internet uh, and other data center uh, applications in future. And he was very much convinced based on my passion and based on my explanation. He said, it looks and sounds very interesting. But I will talk to my boss, uh, Rich Shapiro, who was the general partner of the venture capitalist, and uh, he said you will talk to him and then get back to me. Then he got back to me in 15 days. Then in the meanwhile, I had met uh, Paul Balderson, who became my co-founder uh, uh, in uh, Brocade, at Brocade. Uh, Paul uh, used to work for Sun Microsystem. Sun Microsystem, he was the director of mass storage. So we thought, uh, both Paul and I felt that we complement each other. I got the switching technology, fiber channel technology background, and he had the storage background. So that's a perfect combination that we uh, de de decided to be founders. Then together, we met with uh, Rich Shapiro and Seth Nyman, uh, uh, which was organized by Seth uh, in 15, uh, 15, 20 days later in Nilfanayo in Palo Alto. You know, there ha he had a dinner, and then at the and, uh, at that moment, Rich Shapiro said, we like the idea, we'll give you seed money, $1.3 million to start the company on one condition that I had to move to Silicon Valley. He, wo he was not ready to give me money to start a company in Canada. So, so that made me just pick up the bag and baggage and move to uh, the Silicon Valley. And, so, and then you settled here and then the company went public and uh, today Brocade is commands quite a bit of market share exactly. in that uh, space, that's S SAN, that's correct. storage area network. We, you know, uh, to be precise, we uh, officially launched the company, started the company on uh, 18th of August 1995. 
1997, we had the first product released. And uh, one, one other very, uh, uh, very uh, unique thing we did. When we started the company, we knew what we were going to develop. But we did not start developing because we were put it on a paper, put it on a presentation form. We crisscrossed the country, talked to future potential customers, tell them what we are going to do, how it is going to add value to their applications and uh, use. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful trip that we had. We, had, we had accumulated a lot of good feedback. We brought the feedback ba back to the, uh, to the company, sat with the engineers, fed them, then they took this uh, you know, feedback and then froze the design. Then we uh, developed the product. That helped us a lot in, 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 you know, in fact that uh, when we went back to them during the sales cycle and there were no surprises, they got what they wanted. Mm -hmm. That's how we built the, uh, it's no good having a product not being able to sell. Mm -hmm. So we created the uh, groundwork and the foundation for the sales uh, you know, cycle uh, even before we uh, developed the product. Kumar, thank you so much for talking about okay. how you founded a company, not once but twice, co-founded a company. We'll be back again and talk to you about okay. your work in philanthropy and education. And just to close the loop on Brocade, Brocade is now a publicly traded company. Publicly traded. We went public in 1999, May 24th. It, uh, it, uh, I think it was number two or number one top uh, uh, IPO of the year. And um, you know, we started uh, um, you know, uh, getting more and more customers. It grew one thing you know, led to another and became a, uh, predominantly uh, uh, the storage area networking uh, infrastructure company. Uh, even today, it has more than 70% of the market share. Even right. Cisco could not uh, dismantle it. <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations. Thank Thanks you. for sharing the story. And thank you for watching. We'll be back with another edition where we'll be talking with Kumar about his work in the area of philanthropy and education. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you.